Hey everybody, thanks for watching our YouTube channel. We're constantly updating it with new content and never seen before content. So if you want to get the latest from Harvest, hit the subscribe button. Most people deep down inside want to be happy. My goodness, it's even in our Declaration of Independence that we want to be happy in the United States of America. And to the point, even those who say they don't want to be happy, but rather they want to be unhappy, find a certain happiness in their unhappiness. A case in point, have you ever seen a Woody Allen movie? It's sort of like celebrating misery and making it funny too. Well, that's because deep down inside, we all want to be happy. It's been said, quote, there are two things that are true of every person. We all want to be happy and we're all going to die. By the way, you may be surprised to know that God wired you that way. And this goes back for centuries. Augustine in AD 397 said, quote, everyone, whatever his condition, desires to be happy, end quote. Nearly 13 centuries later, French philosopher and mathematician Blaise Pascal wrote, all men seek happiness, this is without exception. I read uh, in the newspaper a while back the lead singer of one of the most well-known rock bands in the world, and he was quoted to say this, you ask me if I'm happy. Listen, I bought myself a Rolls Royce. I'm part of the biggest band in the world, and I'm about to move into a luxurious mansion. Am I happy with that? No, I'm not. I want more. See, some things never really change. When comedian Dave Chappelle was making millions of dollars, he found he was not happy, and he was quoted to say, the higher up I go, the less happy I am. So is happiness a lost cause? Marilyn Manson said, quote, anyone who thinks they're happy should really go see a doctor because there's no reason to be happy, end quote. Milton Burl, the comedian, said, quote, a man doesn't know what true happiness is until he gets married, then it's too late. So <laughs> only I would quote Marilyn Manson, Dave Chappelle, and, Mar and, uh, and Milton Burl in the same sermon, right, okay? But I'm just trying to show you this, the spectrum of opinions on the topic. George Burns, another comedian from years gone by said, happiness, it's having a large, loving, caring, close-knit family in another city. Okay, so there was always a punchline with those guys. But listen, despite what all these people tell us, according to the Bible, you can be happy. According to the Bible, you should be happy. And you just need to look for it in the wrong, in the right place. And the problem is far too many people look in the wrong place and then they conclude if they don't find it there that happiness cannot be found. Before I tell you what happiness is and where to find it, let me tell you where you will not find happiness. Number one, being beautiful or handsome will not bring personal happiness. Let me say that again, being beautiful or handsome will not bring you personal happiness. I know this from experience. <laughs> that wasn't a joke. That kind of hurt a little bit, honestly, I mean, to be laughed at in the face? No, I meant it. I meant it as a joke. You know, because I think people think, you know, if I was as beautiful as the girls I see in the magazines and the ads, or if I was as handsome as the movie stars, etc., I'd be happy. In fact, 94% of girls age 18 and under wish they were more beautiful. Let me take a quick poll. How many of you girls wish you were more beautiful? Just be truthful. You wish you were more beautiful. Raise your hand. Yeah, there you go. Okay. How, oh, wow, that's interesting. So, having said that, how many of you think you're already beautiful? Raise your hand. <laughs> how? Okay. I don't disagree. I'm just interested. Um, but most people always will say, well, you know, I'm okay, but, well, look at her. I'm all right, but look at him. 85% of women over 40 say they're not as attractive as the average women, woman. And that's why last year Americans spent $11.4 billion on cosmetic surgeon fees. And that was Newport Beach alone. <laughs> I 
I've seen some, and I'm thinking, really? <laughs> you say, oh, I want to look like the model in the magazine. Newsflash, the model doesn't even look like the model in the magazine. <laughs> Haven't you ever heard of Photoshop? Little airbrushing? The 2014 Annual Academy of Facial Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery survey blamed the rise of the selfie. They said, we're taking so many photos of ourselves more than ever before. We use Photoshop, Instagram filters, and other enhancements to look our best. And they say plastic surgery is the next logical step. You're always going to find someone more beautiful than you. Uh, beauty and handsomeness, uh, physical attractiveness will not make you happy. Number two, personal possessions will not bring personal happiness. They can improve your life, make your life more comfortable, but they will not bring the real happiness you're searching for. There was an article in Time Magazine uh, that had the title, The Real Truth About Money. And it said, quote, clinical depression is three to 10 times as common today then two generations ago, money jangles in our wallets and purses as never before, but we are no happier for it. In fact, for many, more money leads to more depression. Maybe that's why Proverbs 27, 20 says, hell and destruction are never full, and so is the heart of man never satisfied. Having relationships will not ha make you happy. Now look, you're wired for relationship. You're wired to have someone that you will love and, uh, and marry one day. That's not a bad thing, but if you say marriage is gonna make you happy, you're gonna be in for a big shock. Maybe even before the honeymoon is over. And, you know, because we're asking a person to do something a person simply cannot do, and we as a person can't meet all the needs of another person because people let us down. Parents let down children, children let down parents, Husbands let down wives, wives let down husbands, Cat, all, cats always let down their owners. <laughs> Dogs do better. <laughs> Number four, pursuing pleasure will never bring personal happiness. Pursuing pleasure. I didn't say you can't have happiness in pleasure. There are many fine pleasures in life that are good. You know, a, a nice meal, a beautiful sunset, time with people you love, those are good pleasures. But then there are perverse pleasures, uh, pleasures that are sinful. And the Bible even says there can be a little fun in the pleasure for a time, but then comes the repercussions of it. And you know, you think, well, if I just, you know, tried this drug, or if I drank a little bit more, or I had this experience. No, none of those things in and of themselves will make you happy because after the rush and excitement wear off, the deadness kicks in. That's why the Bible says in 1 Timothy 5, 6, she that lives for pleasure is dead while she's living. You wanna be a real zombie, not like you see on TV but a walking dead person, be a person that lives for pleasure. It'll never make you happy. In fact, living for pleasure is one of the most unpleasurable things you can do. It's been said, the best cure for hedonism is an attempt to practice it. So, all right, happiness doesn't come from those things. And where does it come from? Where do you find personal happiness? Simple answer, the only place to find real, lasting happiness Happiness is in a relationship with God. And we'll establish that clearly in the book of Philippians. C.S. Lewis, the great thinker and writer, put it this way, quote, God designed the human machine to run on himself. He himself is the fuel our spirits were designed to burn or the food our spirits were designed to feed on. There is no other. That is why it is just no good asking God to make us happy in our own way God cannot give us the happiness and peace apart from himself, end quote. And that is so true. The people that know God are the happiest people. One of the world's foremost experts on the topic of happiness made this statement. I don't have a religious or spiritual bone in my body, yet I have to admit that the studies show that people with faith in God are happier. And why is that? Well, when you have faith, you have hope. 
Because you know life is not just this span on this earth. You know there's an afterlife. And if you put your faith in Christ, you have the hope of heaven. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you will by nature be a forgiving person. You see? It's been said, the first to apologize is the bravest. The first to forgive is the strongest. The first to forget is the happiest. End quote. And that's true. When you forgive and you forget, that will bring you happiness. So because we have hope, because we forgive, because we have faith, it gives us a happier state. And here's something that might surprise you. God wants you to be happy. Remember when the angels announced the birth of Jesus, they said we bring you great news or joy, or news of great joy. But it can be translated, good news of great happiness. And also we read in Luke 10, 20, Jesus said, be happy that your names are written in heaven. So he's telling us to be a happy person. Now that doesn't mean if you're a Christian, you won't have sadness. And sadness is not always a bad thing. You know, sadness has its place, especially when you're mourning someone you love that maybe is gone or, or something else. It's okay. It's a process that we have where we we cry out to God and deal with these things. But even in the midst of sorrow, even in the midst of mourning, you can still have this deep-seated happiness. It doesn't come from what you have or don't have. It comes from who you know. By the way, there are 2,700 passages in the Bible containing words like joy, happiness, pleasure, laughter, gladness, feasting, and celebration. Let me say that again. Wrap your mind around this. There are 2,700 passages in the Bible containing words such as joy, happiness, pleasure, laughter, gladness, feasting, and celebration. So when you see someone that, you know, they never smile and, and they're never happy, you say, man, you need to read your Bible more. Because God wants you to be a happy person. And know this, even God himself is happy. Have you ever thought about that? You know, when you look at the false gods of this world, they're never happy. You ever look at the tiki gods in Hawaii? You know, people like to collect them. They're actual gods, and they're always mad. They have a big frown on their face. Usually their tongue is sticking out. Buddha, he's not really happy. He looks, for the most part, to be asleep. I've seen a couple with a slight little smile on his face. But, uh, you know, the, these other gods are not happy, but we serve the happy God. In John 15, Jesus said, I've told you this to make you completely happy as I am. Jesus was happy, but great weight. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. That's true. The Bible says that. But he said, I want you to be happy like I'm happy. Do you think Jesus always went around crying and with a frown on his face? I think when that verse is telling us he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, it's describing the time when he was carrying the cross to Calvary and bearing the sins of the world. But I think Jesus was a happy Savior, a smiling Savior. Do you think children would have wanted to be around Jesus if he wasn't approachable? I think it was that warmth that he had that drew them in. So we serve a happy God and he wants us to be happy as well. In fact, uh, Paul writes, the glorious news entrusted to me by the blessed God. Or a better translation would be the good news from the happy God. I like that, don't you? The happy God. And that is one of the main themes running through the book of Philippians. Yet, the fact of the matter is, is circumstantially, the apostle Paul, the author of this book, had nothing to be happy about. He had nothing outwardly to rejoice about. He didn't write this from some ivory tower. He was writing this from a prison cell in Rome. And you know what? Paul knew a lot about personal hardship and discomfort. Uh, he suffered more than most people ever will. In 2 Corinthians eleven twenty four, here's what he says. I've worked harder. I've been put in jail more often. I've been whipped times without number. I faced death again and again. Five different times the Jews gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned and left for dead, I might add. 
Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and day adrift at sea. I've traveled many weary miles. I faced danger from flooded rivers and waters. I faced danger from my own people, the Jews as well as the Gentiles. I faced danger in the cities and the deserts and on the stormy seas. I faced danger from those who claim to be Christians but are not. I've lived with weariness and pain and sleepless nights. Often I've been hungry and thirsty and I've gone without food. Often I've shivered with cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. And beside all of this, I have the daily burden of how the churches are getting along. <laughs> wow. So you think you have problems? I was talking about a cold. It seems pretty silly compared to what the Apostle Paul went through. He wrote this book from Rome. Now when we think of Rome today, you know, we think of a city of ruins, amazing pizza and pasta, scooters everywhere, the Treve Fountain, you know, things like that. Maybe a romantic spot. Well, the Rome of Paul's day was a much different place. It was effectively the capital of the world. The Roman Empire had bludgeoned the planet into submission. And uh, living in Rome at this time was a very dangerous thing because Caesar Nero was in power. He was probably the worst of the Caesars. Uh, he instituted daily uh, contests in the arena between the gladiators there in the great Colosseum, a good part of which is still standing in Rome today. And uh, he became progressively more bloodthirsty and decadent. Uh, a contemporary of Nero, a Roman philosopher known as Seneca, wrote with dismay saying, I felt as if I was living in a sewer, end quote. Nero is believed to be the one who set Rome on fire and then he blamed it on the Christians. We know historically that Caesar Nero took a perverse pleasure in torturing and murdering followers of Jesus Christ. Stories are told of how he would cover them in animal skins and let them be attacked by dogs. He would crucify them. He would even cover Christians in pitch and set them aflame to light his garden as he would ride around in his chariot. His, uh, his mother was murdered by him. He murdered his wife and his mother, uh, Agrippina, and uh, after his rise to power. And her last words tell something of how wicked Nero had become as the emperor. She said to the executioner, the good thing about my death is the womb that bore Nero is now dead. Wow, this is one bad dude. And he was in power. And this is where Paul was. And yet he's brimming with joy. And he's talking about happiness. He's chained to a Roman guard day and night. His case was coming up shortly, but Paul didn't know how it would turn out. He might be acquitted. He might be beheaded. Uh, he originally wanted to preach in Rome and he ends up here as a prisoner. And if this isn't bad enough, many of the believers were against him. They were spreading lies about the great apostle. So he was under the most miserable circumstances imaginable. And yet here he is rejoicing. But he was immobilized. You know, Paul was a kind of get the job done sort of guy. And for him to be chained up and, and not able to get out and move about was very hard for him. And maybe you find yourself in a similar situation. You're immobilized. Maybe you're unable to move physically. Or perhaps in some other way. You're in a marriage that's tough sledding at the moment. A job you would love to get out of. A school you would like to transfer from. A neighborhood you would like to move from. Or a sermon you don't want to hear anymore. I just thought, throw that in. Here's what Paul is saying, despite your circumstances, even if you're immobilized, you can have great happiness. And that's what he says over and over again. In fact, of all the things that Paul wrote, this is probably the most buoyant, happy, joyful book of all. And uh, let's try to figure out why he was so happy in this epistle. At least 19 times in these four chapters, Paul mentions joy, rejoicing, or gladness. He might write these notations down. When he first thought of the Philippian believers, it brought a smile to his face. And in Philippians 1, 3 to 4, he says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in prayer, making request for you all with joy. So Paul was Southern. Make request for y'all with joy. So when he would think about the believers there, 
It would bring a smile to his face. When he encouraged them to work together as Christians, he got joyful thinking about it. In Philippians 2, he says, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit or affection and mercy, fulfill my joy and be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. You know, I was just doing an interview with my friend Frank Sontag, who is on KKLA, and, and we were there in the... Uh, lobby of our church, the foyer. Uh, and we were just talking about different things and, and people were starting to come in. And I just sort of sat there watching everybody as I'm talking to Frank and I'm thinking, look at all these happy people. And they're here at church and they've developed friendships and, and there's a bond there. And I know people who've met each other in church and have gotten married and are getting married. And, and I just think this is a wonderful thing when the church works and we can have this fellowship and this joy together. So Paul said, man, that, that makes me happy. When we can work together, that brings me joy. You know, I'm thrilled at a crusade when I see people come forward, but I'm equally as thrilled when I see all y'all out there helping to get the job done. And I look down and I recognize this usher and I know this counselor and this person working in security and this other person helping tear down equipment or build the stage. And, and I look at all these folks and I think they're all here serving the Lord and, and serving the Lord together. And that is a wonderful thing. Listen to this. Even when he thought of his potential death, there was still this happiness and joy. Because Paul writes in Philippians 1.21, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I live in the flesh, this will mean more fruit for my labor. And what I'll choose I can't tell, but I'm hard pressed between the two. Having the desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is needful for you. And being confident of this, I'll remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith. But here's the bottom line of Paul's happiness. It's found in Philippians 4.4 4 when he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. That's the key. It's rejoicing in the Lord. It's not rejoicing in your condition. Or rejoicing in your circumstances. Or rejoicing in your current emotional state. Or rejoicing in something else. It's rejoice in the Lord. Now, Having established this, a couple of questions come to mind. Number one, how could Paul be so positive, so happy, so jubilant in such adverse circumstances? And number two, is this something I can experience today? And if so, how? Let me answer the second question first. Yes, you can experience this joy, but you must meet the criteria that is laid out in this book. And the secret to happiness is found in another word that is often repeated in the book of Philippians, and it is the word mind, M-I-N-D, mind. Paul uses the word mind 10 times. He uses the word think five times. At the times he uses the word remember, and that's 16 references to the mind. In other words, the secret of Christian happiness is found in the way a believer thinks. Notice I did not say the secret of Christian happiness is found in the way a believer feels. No, the way you think. You learn to think right. You learn to think biblically. You fill your mind with the truth of God. It changes your outlook. Now, I'm not talking about you know, positive thinking or possibility thinking. I'm talking about having a mind that is filled with God's truth. I'm talking about having the mind of Christ. And Paul writes, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So it comes down to the way that you think. And Paul filled his mind with God's truth. And he shows us how to live happily and in harmony with other people. And you know, we're a very divided people in America right now. You've probably noticed that. I mean, we're, we're, I don't know that we've ever been more divided. Or if we have been, I don't know that it was much worse than it is today. This is just incredible how many divisions there are. And uh, Paul's telling us how to come together. Those barriers can be overcome in Jesus Christ as we love and pray and serve the Lord together. 
And the book of Philippians shows us how. But first, we must learn how to think biblically. Because listen, you're always going to find someone or something to blame for your sour and bitter outlook on life. Well, the reason I'm the way that I am is because this person did this to me. That person did that. This boss did that. That pastor did that. This other person said this. You know, there has to come a point where you realize you just have to stop blaming people. It comes down to this. The troubles between man and man or man and woman is really the trouble within man himself. The person who is in conflict with himself generally is in conflict with everyone else. So I just need to get right with God. I need to forgive those that have wronged me. And I need to start thinking biblically. And then I will discover true and lasting happiness. So it starts with getting right with the Lord. And you have to begin there. So let's dig in. That was the introduction, by the way. <laughs> now let's have a Bible study. <laughs> Grab your Bible or your phone or your tablet device. Or if the person sitting in front of you has Philippians 1 tattooed on their head, you can read that. <laughs> Philippians 1, we're going to read verses 1 to 6. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus or in Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine making request for you all with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it under the day of Jesus Christ. We'll stop there. Let's start with verse 1. To the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. You know, it's very easy when we read epistles to sort of skip over the opening statements as though they have no relevance to us. But we don't want to do that because really, Paul gives us the door to the life of happiness. You must be one of the saints. So if you want to be happy, be a saint. Oh, well that leads me out. I'm not Mother Teresa, you know. I'm, I'm a sinner. Yeah, I know that. We're all sinners. But you have to understand what the word saint means. It's an interchangeable word with the word believer. How many of you are believers in Jesus Christ? Raise your hand up. I, therefore, saint, all of you. See, but I didn't even need to do that. You're already saints. If you're a believer, you're a saint. If you're a saint, you're a believer. In fact, uh, we read when the Lord told Ananias to go pray for the newly converted Saul of Tarsus, later to become the Apostle Paul, Ananias responded, Lord, I've heard how much harm this man did to your saints in Jerusalem. Remember, Paul would chase down Christians and arrest them and sometimes even murder them. He presided over the death of the first martyr of the church, Stephen. But the reference is to the saints. So if you're in Christ Jesus, you are a saint. But notice, it's a saint in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. Believers are not saints because they're perfect. Believers are saints because they're in Christ. And Jesus imputes his righteousness to them as a result. Listen to me. I am a righteous man. Well, I don't know, Greg, I've seen you drive. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, I'm not righteous because of what I do. I'm righteous because what, of what he has done for me. And he's put his righteousness into my spiritual bank account, so to speak. That's called being justified. I'm positionally righteous. Now, living it out, that's another story. That's where the word sanctification comes in. You ever heard that word? Sanctification is living out justification. And those are sort of words that we may not understand, but justified is being made right with God. I'm in a right standing with God, but sanctification is living that out day to day in a practical way. But I am righteous and I am a saint. Now you don't have to call me Saint Gregory if you don't want to, but uh, I might call you Saint something. And why am I a saint? Because I'm in Christ. A Buddhist does not speak of himself as being in Buddha, nor does a Muslim speak of himself as being in Muhammad, 
nor does a Mormon speak of himself as being in Joseph Smith. They may try to follow the teachings of these people, but they're not in them. But a Christian is a saint because he's in Christ. In Christ. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is an altogether different kind of person. Old things have passed away. Everything becomes fresh in you. So I bring this up for this reason. The book of Philippians, and for the, to the point, the rest of the New Testament, has nothing to say to the world that does not believe in Jesus Christ. Here's what God says to the world. Repent and believe in Jesus. That's our message to the world. Come to Jesus. And so when people say, oh, I found the Bible is just the greatest self-help book ever written and it tells you how to, how to have a better marriage and how to have a happier life. No, that, that's actually not accurate because the Bible is not given to non-believers to take the principles and try to live by them. No, the Bible is given to God's people. It's come to show us we need God. The point of entry is your admission of your sin and your need for God. And then it results in you putting your faith in Christ. And 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us what the Bible's for. It's here to teach us what is true. To make us realize what's wrong in our lives. It straightens us out and teaches us to do what is right. So this is who it is written to. To saints. So you must... Be a saint or, another way to put it, you must be a believer. So who in particular is Paul offering these principles of happiness to? He's offering to those who have believed in Jesus. Now, I want you to notice a wonderful promise that is given to the saint. Verse 6, he who has begun a good work in you will complete it under the day of Jesus Christ. God always finishes what he begins. Greg does not always finish what he begins. Greg starts projects and doesn't always finish projects. Maybe you're the same way. But God always completes what he has started. With man you have unfinished books, unfinished songs, unfinished buildings. And why? Well, maybe it's a lack of resources or power. But more often than not, it's just a lack of desire. You lose interest in it. You have marriages falling apart. Well, I just lost interest in it. You have something else falling apart. Well, I just didn't care anymore. God always finishes what he starts. Because God has unlimited resources. He has unlimited power. And listen to this. He has unlimited interest in you. See, he loves you. And he sees the, the finished work. He sees the finished painting. He sees the finished sculpture. He sees the finished you. He sees the ultimate you. Who you will become one day. You just see the flaws. You just see the shortcomings. You ever look in one of those magnify mirrors? Oh, I hate those. They're just horrible. Because they expose your flaws and they magnify your flaws, right? But God sees your flaws. He, he knows everything about you. He knows your flaws better than you know your flaws. Trust me. But he also sees your potential. And he sees his plan. And he sees the end game that he has for each of you. He's going to bring what he started in your life to completion. Hebrews 12 says, we are to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. So I have good news. You're going to make it. You're going to make it to the end. Isn't that good news? Go ahead and clap for that. Now, because maybe you say, oh, this world's such a horrible place and the devil's so powerful, I might just fall away. Well, really? Do you want to fall away? Well, no. Do you want to continue on as a follower of Jesus? Well, yes. Well, then you will. Because as we read, it is God that works in us both to will and do of his good pleasure. God wants to do it. If you want to do it, friend, we have a game plan. Now if you're sabotaging what God is doing, if you're resisting what God is doing, if you're fighting with God, even then he won't give up on you. Even then he will patiently bring you along. But if you determined to rebel against his plan? Well, yeah, you, you can end it, but that's not God's fault. That's your fault. But listen, the bottom line is you're going to make it if you want to make it. If you're willing and desiring to go forward as a Christian, then you will. It is God that works in you. 
And I want you to also notice that he's working in you to will and do of his good pleasure, Philippians 2.13. Good pleasure. God's plan for you is good. One of my favorite passages is Jeremiah 29.11, where God says, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. So God is saying, I'm thinking about you. And by the way, my thoughts are good. And I have a future and a plan and a purpose for each of you. His thoughts are good. It's a good work that he wants to do. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it under the day of Jesus Christ. You know, some of you are, are maybe young and you're wondering about your future. You're still single. You're wondering, you know, am I ever going to meet that right guy or that right girl? You're thinking about your career. What am I going to do with my life? Uh, you're thinking about other things. You know, what will my health be like? How long will I live? Uh, will I reach goals that I've set for myself? What's in my future? You think about that a lot. Now, as you get older, you're wondering, well, how much longer will I live? And how will the end of my life be? Will my health still be good? Will it be failing? Will I be dependent on others? Uh, what's going to happen in the end? You know, you have these thoughts. Well, God has your future all sorted out and all put together. So the best thing is you need to just trust him. I don't know about you, but I like to know what's coming. You know, when I'm on the road driving, you know that driver that's in this lane, then he's over in this lane, then he's back in this lane, now he's up here, and it, that's me. That's me. Because when I look down a road, I have the next eight moves figured out. And in those moves, I'm putting into play all the stupid moves other people will make. And I'll tell you, you really do this a lot when you ride a motorcycle. Because I, I ride a bike, and uh, when you ride a motorcycle, you have to basically come to one conclusion. Everyone on the road is a moron. <laughs> They're gonna do the worst things possible. That guy's gonna pull right in front of you because uh, he didn't notice you were there because he's on his cell phone. And this guy's gonna swerve into your lane because he's eating a cheeseburger. And, and this person over here isn't gonna see you because she's putting her makeup on, right, in her, in her rearview mirror. And, and this other person is drunk. And this other person, whatever. But so you're, you're like putting all these things in place. You're kind of going down the road. You ride very defensively. And, and I don't like being behind a tall vehicle because I don't know what's ahead. You ever been in a fast lane, carpool lane, and uh, the vehicle in front of you is going very slow. Say, oh, the traffic is horrible. And then you pull out and you realize this is the only person going slow. <laughs> but you couldn't see that because he blocked your view. Why do people go so slow in the carpool lane? Why? I mean, they don't even go the speed limit. They go under the speed limit. Snails are passing them. Anyway, feels good to get that all out. It really does. It's... So we like to see ahead. So we can plan. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Well, God doesn't always let us see ahead. But he sees ahead. See, he's the one driving the car. He's the one in the cockpit. You don't want that God is my co-pilot sticker on your car anymore. Rip it off. God's not your co-pilot. God doesn't even want you in the cockpit. <laughs> he wants you to put your seatbelt on and, and, you know, have your seat in the upright position and your carry-on stowed away. That he, he's in charge. And he's going to get you to your destination. So we have to trust him on these things. It's all good. We sometimes say, it's all good, man. It's all good. Don't panic, it's organic. <laughs> what do these things mean? It's all good. I don't, it's not always good. No, it's all good. Well, it's not good right now talking to you. But in a way, that statement has some truth to it. It's all good. Now I'm talking to a Christian. I'm talking to a saint. I'm talking to a believer. It's all good. In the big picture, I didn't say there won't be some bad moments. I didn't say hard things will not happen to you. I didn't even say tragedy will not befall you. I just said it's all good. In that God will work all things together for good to those that love him and are called according to his purpose. 
The last time I taught this series was in January of 2008. So I keep all of my notes on my computer and I go back and review old notes and then I'll rebuild the messages. And sometimes I'll pull elements from the last time I gave the message. And this is very interesting because I, I'm looking at this whole section that I wrote on all things working together for good and we don't know our future and, and we need to trust God. And I even wrote in my notes, you know, sometimes that seem like they are bad will ultimately turn out to be good. And, and I thought, when did I write this? And I saw, oh wow, January 2008. And I wish I could just say to Greg of 2008, Greg, you have no idea what's ahead of you, buddy. Because that same year is the year our son died in an automobile accident. So I went back over my old notes and I thought, do I still agree with the old Greg? Was Greg right when he wrote these things? Are these things actually theologically true? And, and are they also true practically? I mean, have I known these things to be true? And I had to look back and say, you know what? I don't dis disagree with anything I said. And, and it's not because I said it. It's not because I wrote it. It's because it's in the Bible. And, you know, when you're going through a bad thing, and someone here listening to me is going through a bad thing right now. I just know it. Really bad thing. You've lost a loved one. You found out you have cancer. You have some big trauma that's happened in your life. Your husband or your wife told you they want to divorce you. Something's happened with your kids. I, just all kinds of things. I know something bad has happened. You're thinking, okay, th this is it. This doesn't make sense. Some even say, I I'm starting to lose my faith over this. Listen, the faith that cannot be tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. Your faith is going to be tested. And bad things are going to happen in your life that are inexplicable. But that doesn't mean God is not good. And that does not mean that God still does not work all things together for good. What it does mean is bad things happen to good people. And more to the point, bad things happen to godly people. And that should not shake your faith because God never promised you a pain-free life. God never promised you a trauma-free life. In fact, he promised you this. In this world, you will have tribulation. But then he went on to say, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Here, here's what I'm saying. Yeah. Here's what I'm saying. Because you're saying, now I'm getting really depressed right now. I mean, like, you know, you're going to give a message on happiness. It says happiness on the screen behind you. The pulpit says happiness with little faces. It's yellow, which is a happy color. And you're like, such a downer. I'm just trying to be truthful. Yes, you can have this happiness. But let's see what it is and what it isn't. It's not just the emotional high of some pleasure or experience. It's a deep-seated faith and trust in God. Knowing that, yeah, it's all good because one day when I get to heaven and I look back on earth with an eternal perspective, I'll realize that God was in control of everything that happened to me. Even the bad things that were allowed, he ultimately used for his good. Because after Romans 8.28, the oft-quoted verse comes Romans 8.29. You all know Romans 8.28, right? Let's say it together, ready? All things work together for good to those that love God and are the called according to his purpose. Okay, but now verse 29 continues on. And by the way, in the original verses when they were given, there were no verse breaks. It just went on. All things work together for good to those that love God and are the call, called according to his purpose. For whom God did foreknow, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his own dear son. There's your big picture. It's all good, man. Because ultimately, God is going to make you more like Jesus. And there are things in life that are not easy at the time, but they'll make you more like Jesus. He's going to complete what he started. So don't worry about it. Just keep walking forward and start experiencing this joy and happiness that God offers. I saw an advertisement in, I believe it was a computer magazine, quite a few years ago. And it's a picture of a guy shaving in the mirror. And it asks this question, is it an alarm clock 
or a calling that gets you up in the morning? I thought, well, that's a good question. And they were selling some who knows what computer item, but I thought it was a bigger question. Is it an alarm or a calling that gets you up in the morning? I mean, what makes you tick? What do you get fired up about? Everybody is passionate about something. What do you get up for in the morning? I know it doesn't hurt if I smoke coffee in the morning. Throw in some bacon and eggs and now we're talking. Come on, the smell of bacon in the morning for you vegetarians, the smell of Brussels sprouts <laughs> and kale or whatever you enjoy. But, uh, but I'm talking about more than that. I'm talking about what really gets you moving in life, what gives your life purpose or a sense of meaning, raising it above the level of mere existence. Because, you know, we don't want our lives to just be some blip on the screen. We don't want to be just another statistic. We want our lives to matter. So my question is, what is your master passion in life? If you were to sum up what you live for in one word, what would it be? Well, some would say, for me to live is, you know, to just live. My, to live is to live. Uh, you know, their philosophy would be take it one day at a time. They just sort of exist almost in an animal-like state, just kind of following impulses and, and desires and so forth. They, they just sort of live for the moment. They live for the next paycheck. They live for the next weekend. They're just sort of existing. Uh, Paul talks about people like this. He says, their God is their belly. And some people's gods are bigger than other people's gods, right? But, but when he said belly, he didn't mean their actual stomach. He meant their appetites. In other words, their God is their appetite. They just live for satisfying the appetites that they have in life. Man, that is just a really lame way to live. Number two, there are some that would say, well, for me to live is pleasure. You know, it's just living for pleasure. Living for that experience, living for that rush, living for that buzz, living for that excitement. They might seek it through drinking. They might, they're not happy till, you know, they get that buzz, right? Or some, they're not happy till they're passed out, I suppose, because they do it every night. Or they want that drug high, or they, they want that adrenaline rush, or whatever it is. They live for pleasure. One person said, living for pleasure is one of the least pleasurable things a person can do. And I think that's really true. The Bible even says, she that lives for pleasure is dead while she's living. And by the way, this is not new to our times. Going back 2,000 years, the popular philosophers of the day were called the Epicureans. And the teaching of Epicurus, their founder, was the chief purpose of life is pleasure. So they were living for that as well. And in fact, Caesar Nero was in power at this time. He was the Caesar or the emperor of Rome. And he himself said to live was to be like an unbridled beast in pleasure, passion, and partying. Man, Caesar would have fit in with everybody else today, or many people today. Maybe our modern equivalent would be what we call the playboy philosophy. You know, Hugh Hefner would be the patron saint. So if you want to end up as an old guy in pajamas wearing a captain's hat, go for it. <laughs> Pretty sad way to live a life, I think. Chased after pleasure his whole life. But uh, this is the idea that cast off all restraints, no absolutes. You do whatever you want to do. If it feels good, do it. That's what some people live for. The Bible tells us this is a dead end street. Others might say, well, you know what? I live to get even. <laughs> I don't get mad, I get even. Their philosophy is not live and let live. Their philosophy is live and let die. If you get me, I'm going to get you back. And you know, a lot of these people happen to be driving cars, I think. You know, like you're at the light and the light turns green. It's, it's not even a second. It's not a half a second. It's just like a fraction of a second. They lay on the horn behind you. They tailgate you the whole time, cut you off. These kind of aggravated people that are basically always in a perpetual bad mood. And they're always at war with someone. They always have their nemesis. They always like to be in a fight. They love to be in a conflict. Uh, this, there are people like this that live for these things. Another might say, well, I mean, I live for possessions. It's to get stuff. And then when I get that stuff, I want to get more stuff. And then when I get that other stuff, I, I need to get rid of this old stuff so I can make room for new stuff. 
and they're just always collecting items and objects and it's always that next shiny thing. It might be a shiny car or a shiny ring or a shiny computer or whatever it is they're chasing after, but it's a object or a thing. Their philosophy would be, he that dies with the most toys wins. And I would just add a dot, dot, dot. He that dies with the most toys wins, dot, 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 nothing. Because Jesus says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? As I've often said, you've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul trailer. You know, you're going to leave everything here on this side, in this life. I mean, Solomon, who lived many years ago, was a man known for his wisdom and also had incredible possessions. And he said this in Ecclesiastes 2.4, I tried to find meaning in my life by building huge homes for myself and planting beautiful vineyards, and I made gardens and parks, and I collected great sums of silver and gold, the treasure of kings and provinces. I hired wonderful singers, men and women, and had beautiful concubines. I had everything a man could desire. Anything I want, I took, and I did not restrain myself from any pleasure. And he says, and one day I looked at all the things that I had accomplished, and all that I had acquired, and it was all meaningless. It was like chasing the wind, there was nothing, Solomon concludes, really worthwhile anywhere. Others might appear more noble and say, well, I, I live to acquire knowledge. You know, I want to learn. I, I want to discover new truth. And that's actually a pretty good thing. It's a lot better than just living for pleasure or living to get even. But if in your pursuit of knowledge you leave God out of the equation, you're just going to end up as a well-educated fool. And I look at a lot of the universities today, and, and I'm not so sure if people are getting an education or if they're getting an indoctrination, you know, and usually in a worldview that's contrary to Scripture. I mean, you look at a lot of these colleges, and you have these safe spaces, you know, where you won't have any conflict or disagreement. It's pretty amazing to me. But, <coughs> excuse me, this is not new to our time either. Um, a philosopher of that day, during Paul's day, was Seneca. He said, the purpose of life is to enjoy oneself in the realm of ideas, to think, to learn, to master the laws of nature, then make the mind the master of men. But again, if you forget God in your pursuit of knowledge, you will have learned nothing. Solomon also went after the pursuit of knowledge. He was known at one point as the wisest man who ever lived. And he said, to increase knowledge only increases sorrow. That's in Ecclesiastes 1.16. But students, don't go home and quote that verse to your parents when they tell you to do your homework. Mom, the Bible says to increase knowledge only increases sorrow. Shut up and do your homework, okay? That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about pursuing knowledge without God. So what do you drive? What are you driven by? What do you dream about? What are you passionate about? I think some people are just enduring. They're just waiting for the next thing. Their favorite day of the week is someday. You know, someday their ship will come in. Someday their prince will come. Someday they'll get that promotion. Someday they'll build that dream house. Or someday they'll retire. I read a stat that said 94% of people who responded to a survey said they were enduring the present while waiting for something better to happen. But the problem is life passes by so quickly. And before you know it, a good deal of your life may be behind you instead of before you. And you'll, found that you've, you'll find that you've been living for nothing. So we need to think about this because then the afterlife comes. So listen to this. Only those who are prepared to die are really ready to live. Let me say that again. Only those who are prepared to die are really ready to live. Now, I've talked about what people live for. Let me tell you what the Apostle Paul lived for. Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Oh, I love that. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, we're going to explore that a little bit more. But let's just do a little backdrop on what we're looking at here. We're looking at the book of Philippians. And the theme that keeps bubbling up through this great epistle is happiness and joy. In fact, this is probably the most buoyant, happy letter that Paul ever wrote. Not that there is not happiness and joy in other epistles he wrote, but it just seems like there's a lot in this one in particular. At least 19 times in these four chapters of Philippians, Paul mentions joy, 
rejoicing, or gladness. But yet circumstantially, he really had nothing to rejoice about. I mean, if we read that Paul wrote this book, you know, kicking back, you know, in the Mediterranean, enjoying life, we'd say, well, yeah, I get it. But he actually wrote this under house arrest. This wasn't, in bad as, uh, wasn't as bad as some of his imprisonment where he might have been like in a dungeon. But this is where he was chained to a Roman guard. Uh, and he was under the control at this point of Caesar Nero. And, and his case was waiting to go to court. And Paul had no idea what was about to happen. He might be acquitted. He might be beheaded. But all he knew was he was a prisoner. He could not walk about freely as he wanted to. And if that wasn't bad enough, some of the believers in the church were against him. Some were even spreading lies about this great apostle. But he knew God was in control. And here's what he wrote, Philippians 1. We're going to start in verse 12 and we'll read down to verse 16. Just put a drop in my eye in case you saw. I wear a contact lens on my right eye. You saw my drops. I'm a dropaholic. <laughs> the moment I stop speaking, I rip the contact out of my eye because I can't stand contact lenses. Just wanted to share that. All right. <laughs> Roman, or Philippians 1, verse 12. Romans, where did that come from? I want you to know, brothers, that the things that happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. So it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident in my chains, are more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and strife. Some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in this re I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. So here's Paul, chained to a Roman guard, writing these words. Can you imagine being one of those guards? I'm sure they didn't like that job at first. Oh no, I have to be chained to this stinking preacher. All he does is talk about God. This is insane. But guard by guard, they were coming to Christ. And then they were probably standing in line as to who would be the next guy to get to be chained to the Apostle Paul for that particular period of time. Because Paul writes in verse 13, it's become evident to the whole palace guard. Now who are the palace guard? These most likely are the Praetorian Guard. The Praetorian Guard were the cream of the crop of the Roman military. Uh, they were 10,000 hand-picked soldiers. They were uh, initially established by Caesar Augustus, who by the way was the Caesar that gave the decree that all the world should be taxed, causing Joseph and Mary to go to Bethlehem. But the Praetorian Guard, they were very powerful people. In fact, they were king makers. Sometimes they would play a key role in deciding who the next Caesar would be. And these were the ones who were chained to the Apostle Paul. And that brings me to point number one. When you live for Christ, you will accept God's will for your life. When you live for Christ, which you all should, we all should be doing, you will accept God's will for your life. See, Paul went to Rome to preach but he ended up under house arrest. Now, how is that a good idea? Well, he was reaching an elite group of people that would have not been reached otherwise. So Paul understood God had his hand in it. Look at verse 12. The things that happened to me have turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Did it ever occur to you that you are where you are because God wants you there right now? Maybe in effect you're chained to someone. And by that I mean... Maybe you're chained to a non-believer. Maybe it's a non-believing husband or a non-believing wife or kids that don't believe what you believe or parents that don't believe what you believe or a argumentative coworker that you sit next to in your office space or some guy on your construction site that's always giving you a hard time and you're thinking, why do I have to be here with this person? Did it ever occur to you that God wants you there to reach that person? You know, sometimes the people that argue the most 
are actually closer to coming to the Lord than those that say nothing. I think a lot of times we think if someone is pleasant and nice and we share the gospel, we think that's a good thing. And then when someone's argumentative, that's a bad thing. But sometimes it's the very opposite. Because it's been said, when you throw a rock into a pack of dogs, the one that barks the loudest is the one that got hit. <laughs> Try it after church. Find some dogs, throw a rock. No, don't do it. <laughs> find a pack of cats. But see, <laughs> you never find a pack of cats. They're very independent creatures. But the idea is the dog that barks the loudest is the one that got hit. So when you share the gospel with someone and one objects and they protest and they scream and they yell, it might be because they're under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And God's working on their hearts. So don't be discouraged. Be encouraged. So Paul is reaching the Praetorian Guard. Really quite significant. And God has put you where you are for his purposes. And he says in verse 14, Most of the brethren in the Lord have become confident by my chains and are more bold to speak the word without fear. You see, examples of evangelism spark others to be more evangelistic. So they're saying, wow, Paul's chained up in a, under house arrest and, and is willing to share the gospel with a praetorian guard. Certainly we who have freedom right now, mobility, we should be doing the same. You know, if you've ever been around an evangelistic Christian, it can be quite contagious. And there are some people, man, they're just always finding opportunities to share their faith. And you think, how do they do that? They're just tuned in, I think. Tuned into the Lord, tuned into opportunities, looking for opportunities even. And you get around a person like that and you think, well, I think I could do that. Yes, you can, as a matter of fact. So Paul's example was inspiring other believers as well. Number two, when you live for Christ, as we all should, you'll be a person of prayer. Again, when you live for Christ, you'll be a person of prayer. Have you ever wondered what to pray for when you pray for fellow believers? Paul actually gives us an answer here. Look at Philippians 1 verse 9. And this I pray, he's saying to the church at Philippi, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment and that you may approve the things that are excellent and that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Interesting. So Paul's praying that they would grow in both love and discernment. Love and discernment. You know, sometimes it seems to me as though the two are Mutually exclusive. In other words, some people seem to be very discerning, but not very loving. And some can be very loving and not very discerning. Now there are people that say, well, I have a discernment ministry, which is another way of saying they like to argue and be obnoxious. <laughs> and you know, I, I just think you're off a little theologically, brother, and they're always challenging everything. And, and I get this sometimes because of my work that I do in evangelism and I'll go to different places and speak and come into contact with different people and so maybe I'm at a conference and there's another speaker I would not agree with in every point theologically and someone says, well, Greg endorses everything that that person says. Well, that's not true. And how do you know what I say to that person, you know, behind closed doors? And I say a lot of things to a lot of people but I don't talk about it publicly because my conversations with people are private. But I try to influence people I come into contact with uh, in every way that I can to help them be closer to the Lord and do what he's called them to do. I don't always do a good job of it, but at least I try. But sometimes it's like, well, guilt by association. You, you know, you talk to that person, therefore you endorse everything. They say, no, not necessarily. But I found some of these people, they're just downright mean. It's like, where's the love, man? They don't even check out the facts. They just jump to conclusions. As J. Vernon McGee used to say, the only exercise some Christians get is running down others and jumping to conclusions. I think that's true. Some people are discerning, but they're not loving. And I would even question if they're really discerning. <laughs> others are loving, but they're not discerning. And by that I mean, they just accept everything and everyone. It's all good, man. We all love the Lord, you know. Hey, whatever they believe, it doesn't matter. Well, actually, it does matter. There is a place for discernment. 
But look at Paul says here in verse one, or actually verse uh, nine, uh, that they would grow in love. This I pray that your love will grow still more. Love is a mark of a true Christian. Don't say to me, I love Jesus, but I don't love the church. You can't love Jesus and not love the church. You can't love God who you can't see if you're not willing to love your brother or sister who you can see. And so a mark of real faith, of real love, is that you'll love your Christian brothers and sisters. Jesus said, by this shall all men know you are my disciples. What? If you have what? One for another. Love one for another. So we should be loving. And the Bible tells us in Romans 5, 5, the love of God is poured out in our hearts. So the love's there. So you don't even need to pray, oh Lord, I, I, you know, I don't have any love. You have some love. But Paul's saying, I pray your love will grow. And you know how your love will grow? Just start doing loving things. Don't wait for the emotion. Just take that little step and that benevolent gesture, the kind word, the word of encouragement. Paul says, I pray that you grow in love. But he also says, I pray that you will grow in knowledge. And the way that we grow in knowledge is through the study of Scripture. That's why we're here tonight, to study the Word of God. This is called a Bible study and a worship service. And I love Bible studies, don't you? Where we can just open up the Word of God and look at what it says and see how it applies in our lives. And it concerns me that some believers are in their knowledge of scripture like brand new Christians still. People that have known the Lord for 10, 20, 30 years that don't even know the basic Bible doctrines and thus they get misled. And that is why Paul also says you need to grow in spiritual discernment. Verse 10 he says that you may approve the things that are excellent. The word approve means to analyze and examine. Think carefully, think biblically, Think analytically. Take all things and compare them to what the scripture says. So we need to be praying these things for others. And we need to be praying that God will do these things in our life as well. Now Paul tells us how living for Christ affects us in this life and the afterlife. Look at verse 21, Philippians 1 still. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, that will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose I cannot tell, for I am hard-pressed between the two. Having the desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, nevertheless to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith. That your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Look again at verse 21, for me to live is Christ. Now when we hear someone say, for me to live is Christ, we wonder, you know, are these people in touch with reality, really? To live is Christ? I mean, what does it even mean? Some will say, well, you know, some are so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. And, and my counterpoint to that is, some are so earthly minded, they're no heavenly good. And I think when you're really heavenly minded, when you're really living for Christ, you will be of the greatest earthly good. C.S. Lewis said, quote, the Christians who did the most for the present world were precisely those who thought most about the next world, end quote. And I think that's true. I mean, you think about the great hospitals and the great universities and other things that have been done historically in our country. In almost every case, at least in their original state, they were started by followers of Jesus Christ. Uh, and you look at the great relief organizations in the world today. They're Christian organizations. Christians are always on the front line wherever people are suffering. It doesn't matter if they believe or if they don't believe. It doesn't matter if they're Christian or if they're Muslims or if, if they're Buddhist. We, if someone, there's a tragedy, if there's a calamity, Christians give, Christians help. Christians are always doing these things. When's the last time you heard of an atheist relief organization? You know, heathen purse, there's no such thing. <laughs> but there's Samaritan's purse, isn't there? You know, non-believers vision. No, I've never heard of them, but I've heard of world vision, you know. So, the, 
because they don't care for the most part. There might be some out there, there might be some exception, but by and large, it's believers out there doing this work. You see, real spirituality is practical. And Paul was a balanced Christian. And the most godly men and women I've had the privilege of meeting over the last 40 plus years have always been very down to earth. You know, not holier than thou kind of people looking down on you, but very genuine people, often fun-loving people, uh, people with a self-deprecating sense of humor, not that spacey, wide-eyed, one clown, short of a circus look. You know what I'm talking about? Heavenly-minded people are gracious, they're approachable, they're accessible, and religious people are just weird. I so don't want to be a religious person. I, you know, but they get this religious vibe and they talk religiously and they look at you weird religiously. It's like, just stop. And here's my suggestion. They were always weird to start with, okay? <laughs> Their faith in Christ did not make them weird. They were weird and now they just talk about Jesus and they're still weird. <laughs> now maybe they're saved weird. I don't know, but they're weird. Okay, that's all I know. Your faith in Christ will not make you that person. If you have faith in Christ and know what it means to live for Christ, you'll have your feet on the ground, but your heart and your thoughts will be in heaven. And I think Paul is an example of this in so many ways. I mean, th there's no greater example of this than Jesus himself. You know, Jesus was a practical man. He was God in human form walking among us, but Jesus lived a real life on planet Earth. He was a real living human being but he was God walking among us. So Paul is saying to live is Christ. And that was pretty much not just Paul's motto, but I think the motto of pretty much everyone in the early church. Uh, you know, if you look at the church of the first century, they changed the world. They changed the world. They turned the world upside down. And imagine it, they did it without media. You know, Thomas didn't have a Twitter account. Peter didn't have an Instagram page. Paul didn't have a Facebook page, but they had a lot of followers and a lot of friends. And they changed the world that was there at the time. The world that was under the rule of Rome. And it's amazing to think about how they did it. The first Christians did not out-argue the pagans. They outlived them. They didn't conquer paganism and dead Judaism by reacting blow by blow. Instead, the Christians of the first century outthought, outprayed, and outlived the non believers. Their weapons were positive, not negative. They didn't stage protests and they didn't hold boycotts. Have you ever noticed that? They didn't have a campaign to unseat the emperor. They would have died if they did that. Instead, they prayed and preached and proclaimed the message of the death of Christ on the cross and his resurrection from the dead, and they backed up that message with actions to match, and they changed the planet. They were out there loving and giving and healing and doing all the things God called them to do. So the slogan of the first century church, the church that changed the world was, to live as Christ and to die as gain. What would the slogan of the 21st century church be? What about my needs, man? Something like that maybe? You know, I go church shopping and I'm going to try to find a church that meets all of my needs. Or maybe I go to multiple churches. Well, listen, if we train people to be consumers instead of communers, we'll end up with customers instead of disciples. Let me say that again. If we train people to be consumers instead of communers, we'll end up with customers instead of disciples. So... This is the church that changed the world, and I pray that we could be the church that changes our world as well. Paul lived for Christ, but he was human. He was not perfect. Did you know the apostle Paul was not perfect? He'd get irritated at times. Uh, you know, when he, when he was um, being mistreated by the high priest servant, and actually guy struck him, he shot back at us. Might you, you whitewash wall. Guy's like, would you say, I oh, didn't know you're the high priest servant and whatever. He got ticked off. Who likes to get hit in the face? Not the apostle Paul. When it was revealed to Paul that there were some guys that wanted to kill him, Paul didn't walk out into the town square and say, here I am, kill me. No, 
he was lowered over the side of the wall in a basket. Why? Because Paul wanted to live to see tomorrow. You know, a Christian doesn't have a death wish. We don't walk around saying, man, I hope I die today. But here's what we do say. To live is Christ and to die is gain. I want to live today. And I want to live tomorrow. And I want to live as many days as God has given me to live. And when that day comes, when I'm called to heaven, then that day will come. But I'm going to do everything I can to live in this day. So Paul was a practical guy. And he cared about the church. Look at verse 23. I'm hard pressed between the two. Having the desire to depart and be with Christ. Which is far better. But it's important for me to remain in the flesh for you. Yeah he wanted to help them. But notice what he says. He says. Having the desire to depart with Christ. Which is far better. Listen to this. Death for a Christian is something that's going to happen as it will happen for every person. But Paul understood that when death came and it did come for him, it was a conscious existence, not an unconscious oblivion. It was to be with Christ. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. In other words, he was not going to just go into a grave. It was the continuation of life, not the conclusion of life. And that life ahead was a greater and better life. Death for the believer is a promotion. Death for the believer is a graduation. Death for the believer is a coronation. Bringing me to point number three. When you live for Christ, you're not afraid to die. When you live for Christ, you're not afraid to die. Again, only the person who has said to live as Christ then, then, can then say... To die is gain. It's interesting the word that Paul uses here for departing. When he says I have a desire to depart and be with Christ. It's translated multiple ways. One way it's translated is to strike the tent. It was a term used to describe what soldiers did. You know they'd set up camp. And then when it was time to leave they would strike the tent. Sort of like when you go camping. Of course camping is a lot more sophisticated now than it used to be. Some might use tents but... You know, some have motor homes, and a motor home is, you know, some of these motor homes are incredible. They have big flat screen TVs on the outside, you know. They have everything that you have in a regular home, and they just go park it and kind of do that thing, and they say they're camping. I don't know if it's really camping. But maybe you'll set up a fire, you know, and then it's time to leave, and you'll, you'll extinguish the fire, and you move on to your next campsite. But you know, for me, I'm not a huge camper. I, I've never loved camping that much. I, my, it's sort of like camping to me is very similar to going to the beach. My favorite part of camping is getting there and then the next favorite part is leaving, you know? It's really exciting. Oh, we're camping and then it gets cold and, and I want to go home. I want a hot shower. I want clean clothes, you know? Or going to the beach. The best part of going to the beach is when you arrive. Oh, it's the beach and the sun is out and, and the waves are looking good. and It's fantastic and nobody's here and I just love the beach. An hour later, you're sweating. Somebody comes and puts their, you know, towel right next to you. When there's like miles around, they're right next to you. And they crank up their radio, really obnoxious music. Seagulls start invading, taking things, taking your lunch, flying off with your children. You know, it's just, <laughs> you say, I want to go. So Paul says, you know what? I'm going to break camp. I'm going to strike the tent. That's the word he uses here for departing. It's interesting because the Bible does compare the human body to a tent. See, your soul will live forever and your body will one day be resurrected into a perfected state. But when a believer dies, their body, the body we live in now goes into the ground, but then it's ultimately resurrected, but the soul goes immediately into the presence of God. But it's interesting that the Bible does call our body a tent. In fact, 2 Corinthians 5, 1 says, uh, we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is when we die and leave these bodies, we'll have a home in heaven. An eternal body made for us by God himself. Now look, you can do all that you want with this tent you live in. You can stretch it and you can paint it and you can do other things to try to make it look younger. But it is what it is, okay? 
And it's not meant to be a permanent dwelling place. Uh, it's temporary. So that is the very picture used in Scripture. Another word, or another way the word departure is translated is being released from shackles. And when Paul wrote this, he was in shackles. He was chained to a Roman guard. So it's like being released from those shackles. Number three, the word is also used to describe untying a boat from its moorings. Untying a boat from its moorings. So Paul is saying, hey, I'm ready to set sail. You know, when a loved one leaves us, especially if it's unexpectedly, there's great sadness. And sometimes we feel sorry for them. We may have a fun experience, a great meal, a family reunion, whatever it is. We'll say, oh, I, I just wish my loved one was with me right now, seeing this right now. I wish they could be here. They'd love it so much. Do you ever wonder and think if your loved one is in heaven thinking, man, I wish they could be up here with me right now, seeing what I'm seeing. I guarantee no one who has gone to heaven would ever want to come back to earth again, if given the choice. Because heaven is so much better, and I'll touch on that in just a moment, but untying a boat from its moorings, that is the picture that he used, bringing me to point number four. When you live for Christ, one day you will be with him in heaven. When you live for Christ, one day you'll be with him in heaven. Look at verse 23. I want to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. And by the way, that's a strong superlative form that Paul uses, which means far, far, far better. Much, much better. Or to put it in sort of a local speak in Hawaii, mo better bra. It's mo better bra. It's way, way better than what you have here. We want to go to heaven. We just don't want to die to get there, right? I heard about an old man who was asked what he wanted said at his funeral. He thought about it for a moment and said, I wish they would say, look, he's moving. You know, as in, you're still alive, right? What do you want said at your funeral? Well, why is heaven better than earth? It's better because I'm moving from a tent to a mansion. I'm moving from a tent to a mansion. How many of you remember the TV show, The Beverly Hillbillies? You're all very old. Some of you, many of you don't. How many of you remember it? Raise your hand again. I say, okay, a lot more of you. Well, how many of you have no idea who I mean when I say The Beverly Hillbillies? Raise your hand. Okay, well, this was a show on a long time ago. And, uh, you know, it's a story of Jed Clampett and his family, and, and they uh, discover oil, and so they move to Beverly Hills, you know, Come and listen to a story about a man named Jed. Poor mountaineer barely kept his family fed. Then one day when he was looking for some food, out from the ground came a bubbling crude. Black gold, that is. Texas tea. The next thing you know, old Jed's a millionaire. The kinfolk say, Jed, move away from there. They say California is the place you ought to be. So they loaded up the truck and they moved to Beverly. Hills, that is. <laughs> Swimming pools, movie stars. So that, that's, those are the lyrics. I don't ever remember consciously memorizing them, but clearly I know them. <laughs> I know other weird lyrics too, but I won't go into all those. But I like that. You know, you loaded up the truck and they moved to Beverly. That's what we'll do. We'll leave our broken down shack for a mansion far better than even Beverly Hills. Heaven's better because it's immediate. Heaven's better because it's immediate. Verse 23, I'll depart and be with Christ. That's very important because often people ask us, what happens when we die? You go straight to heaven. Simple answer. The moment you take your last breath on earth, you take your first breath in heaven. You don't go to a holding tank. He, just, he did not say, I'll depart and just kind of hang out for you know a few hundred years. Or I'll depart and go to purgatory. Or I'll depart and go to a soul sleep. No, I'll depart and be with Christ. You go right into the presence of Jesus Christ. Many verses affirm this. 2 Corinthians 5.8 says, We're confident and I say, we're rather willing to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Thirdly, heaven is better than earth because all my questions will be answered. All my questions will be answered. We all have questions in life. I heard about a, a mother who had some questions. She invited a bunch of people over to her house for dinner. Far too many. It was a lot more work than she thought it would be. 
But everyone was seated at the table. So she asked her little six-year-old daughter if she would say the blessing. A little girl said, well, Mommy, I don't know what to say. And she said, well, just say what you hear Mommy say. So the little girl bowed her head and said, Lord, why on earth did I invite all these people here to dinner? So she heard Mommy say that. <laughs> I'm sure we have more profound questions than that for God. God, where were you in this day? God, why did you let this happen? God, why didn't you let that happen? I have questions for God. We all do. I really wonder if when I get to heaven, I'll, I'll have my list. Lord, it's good to be here, but I have this list. <laughs> I kind of think once I see him, I'll just say, never mind. <laughs> it's all good. Very good. But uh, we'll know all things in that day. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, right now we see him perfectly as in a poor mirror, but then we'll see everything with perfect clarity all that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely just that God knows me now. And I believe that when I get to heaven, I'll spend all eternity learning and learning. I don't think it's like God dumps all this knowledge into my brain. I'd be like some weird bobblehead, you know, just huge head, little body walking around. No, I think you're learning and learning and growing and discovering all through heaven and then ultimately when heaven comes down to earth again. This, this is the hope of the Christian and only the Christian. And lastly, heaven is better because I'll be with Christ. Be with Christ. I'll be with him. Yes, you'll be reunited with loved ones that have preceded you. Yes, all of your questions will be answered. Yes, you'll trade in your tent for a mansion. Yes, it'll be so much better on every level. But yes, you will be with Christ and that's what makes heaven heaven. So wrapping this up, what do you live for? If you say for me to live is money, then for you one day to die is to leave it all behind. If you say for me to live is fame, then one day for you to die is going to be that you'll be forgotten. If you say to me to live is power, then I'm telling you one day to die will be for you to lose it all. But if you say to live is Christ, then you can also say to die is gain. What do you live for? You live for something. You live for something. It gets you up in the morning that fires you up. But that something or that someone that you live for, will they be able to save you in the final day? See, when you live for Christ, it's win-win. It's win-win. Why? Because you have heaven, guaranteed absolute heaven. But this life on earth is life lived to its fullest. The Christian life is the best life. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that more abundantly. So he wants to give you a happy, fulfilled, joyful, purposeful, meaningful life on planet earth. And then the absolute assurance that there's an afterlife for you in his presence in heaven.